Hello everyone, I'm Keith Webster, Dean of University Libraries. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event to celebrate our special collections and showcase the work of our curator, Dr. Sam Lemley. We're all incredibly proud of Sam's accomplishments over the years since he joined us, and they are even more remarkable given that our libraries were in lockdown for the first six months of his time at CMU. It is commonly held that you can't have a great university without a great library. And during the 20th century, that was understood to mean vast collections. Today, much contemporary scholarly content arrives on university campuses and in libraries in digital form. And gone are the days when we can measure current academic content based on the number of books on stacks. That has led to a couple of trends. The first is a sense of loss in that these current materials arriving at our computers are intangible. And secondly, every library acquires pretty much the same materials. So the measure of distinction brought about by the size of collections also has disappeared. These trends have led to a resurgence of interest in special collections in fine and rare books, in scientific instruments, and other materials that support scholarly inquiry and academic research. We are so fortunate at Carnegie Mellon to have some wonderful special collections, and Sam will highlight some treasures from those in this presentation. I'm particularly grateful to those who support our work. The Posner Fine Arts Foundation and Executive Director Anne Malloy for their continued support. Pamela McCordock, a wonderful and generous donor who, with her late husband Joseph Traub, acquired a magnificent collection that now sits in our fine and rare book room. And of course, the Hunt family, who gave Hunt Library the building in which our collections are housed and where I am standing today. Sam and I are presenting to you from the Hunt Institute for Botanical Documentation on the top floor of Hunt Library. And we're grateful to Terry Jacobson, the director, for allowing us to make use of his facility for this production. Enjoy Sam's presentation. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sam Lemley, curator of Special Collections. And thanks, Keith, for that introduction. The first thing that I want to share with you tonight is this book. It's a single volume of a scholarly journal that was published by the Berlin Academy of Sciences in 1710. Um, and for those of us that are familiar with the way that publishing works in academia, the idea of a scholarly journal will be somewhat familiar. But at the time, in 1710, this was an incredibly new and groundbreaking genre. And I think that the real advantage of this form is that it passed the cost of publication uh, from the author, from the printer, off to annual subscribers to the particular journal. And what that meant is that um, scientists, in particular mathematicians, um, but also archaeologists, linguists, really anyone working in sort of um, niche fields, uh, were able to publish very short form discoveries um, and quickly, right? These were sometimes issued monthly. So um, I think you really can't overestimate the impact that this genre had on the history of science uh, and its advancement, its rapid advancement, particularly in the, the 17th and 18th centuries. So in this particular volume, there's a very short article by the German mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, and this article is titled Brevis Descriptio Machinae Arithmeticae, or A Brief Description of an Arithmetic Machine. Um, and you can see that this is something uh, that Leibniz is describing and announcing. In the first line, he says um, he invented it in his adolescence, right, mad or rather modestly, um, and in 1673. Um, but that's interesting in itself, right? So it's only published in 1710, decades later. That's an indication of the amount of um, refining that Leibniz had to do on this machine that he's describing. Um, this is the first published account with an illustration of a mechanical computer. Uh, and Leibniz was uh, sort of, his design was groundbreaking in a number of ways, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. So um, what is this machine? Uh, well, if we turn to an accompanying illustration um, at the back of the book, 
there it is, right? So it's kind of an odd looking thing. It's in a wooden box um, with a handle, some hinges. Um, there are these small windows at the top, um, dials here, and then this sort of hand crank. Um, so you probably can see that we have something right next to me on the table here resembling this illustration. And in fact, um, this is a replica uh, of Leibniz's uh, 17th century um, calculating machine. Um, this particular model was built by an Italian model maker, Roberto Guatelli, uh, in the middle of last century. And it came to CMU with the Traub McCordick collection just a couple years ago. Um, so you can see a little bit in a little bit more detail what's going on with this machine. Unfortunately, we can't take the casing off to show the, the, the sort of intricacies of its mechanics, um, but you can kind of get a sense of how it would be operated. So there again, on the top, up, upper edge, there are these 16 windows, and that's where the solution would appear. So you could calculate um, a solution up to 16 digits. Um, and then there's a small, another small a line of small windows here where you enter um, the digits you're going to be calculating with, right? Um, so Leibniz's machine wasn't entirely groundbreaking. There were actually earlier mechanical calculators much like this. Um, probably most famously, the one that Blaise Pascal invented and designed um, a couple decades before Leibniz, has worked, at, Leibniz worked on his. Um, but significantly, Pascal's um, only did addition and subtraction, right? Um, Leibniz found a way to build a machine that was capable of all four arithmetic operations, right? Subtraction, addition, multiplication, and division. Um, so you can imagine just the, the, the complexity of engineering uh, and also the skill of the people actually tasked with building this thing. Um, it's, it's a monument uh, of engineering and mechanics. Um, so, you know, this is, I think I, I'm starting with this, uh, these, this pair of objects because it kind of encapsulates what I think we want to accomplish in special collections at CMU. You know, we're really interested in telling the history of computing over the long durée, right? Sort of from the 17th century, when you sort of get these early experiments in mechanical calculation, all the way through, you know, mid-century pioneers like Alan Turing, Grace Hopper, uh, von Neumann, et cetera. Uh, these are all names I'm sure this audience will recognize. So, but what is the genealogy, right, between, through and between those centuries? And how can we represent that genealogy and that history in the form of a collection? Um, so that's, that's, that's the main reason why I wanted to start with these two artifacts from Leibniz. The other reason is, you know, insofar as a discipline can be said to originate in one individual, I think um, the history of computer science um, arguably could be said to originate in Leibniz uh, and his immediate circle. Um, because he was not only working on the design and, and, and sort of operation of mechanical computers, calculators, he also developed a system of symbolic logic. Um, and probably most famously, he developed um, the system of binary code, one and zero, uh, that influenced uh, modern binary code that's still used today. So, you know, he's working on these sort of three strands of thought, right? Symbolic logic, binary code, and um, you know, mechanically assisted computing that are still with us, are still with us in the, in the history of computer science, you know, just across campus too. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll just gonna, as a brief aside, um, something else, another treasure in the collection that we have of Leibniz's is a first edition of his Nova Methodus, which is his calculus, um, right? So Leibniz is probably most well known for his invention independently of Newton of the calculus. So this is, this is the first appearance in print of the calculus, 1684. Um, and again, this is in um, an, an annual volume of another scholarly journal called the Acta Erudatorum. Uh, it was published in Leipzig. So very, very common for Leibniz to publish in this form. Um, he published hundreds of articles like this over the course of his career. Um, and this just gives you a sense of the, the range of activity right, that, that he was up to um, over the course of his life. 
With this next object, we jump forward in time, three and a half centuries, to another very familiar name in the history of computer science, and that's Alan Turing. So this is a, a volume of the academic journal, another scholarly publication, uh, Mind, which uh, specialized in human psychology, which might strike us as odd. Alan Turing is obviously dealing with um, computer and machine intelligence, not human intelligence, but he saw a close connection there. Um, so this is volume 59. It was published in 1950. Um, and I'll turn to Turing's article now. So the name, the title of the article is Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Um, and this was an incredibly groundbreaking event um, in sort of the history of the theory of artificial intelligence. It's where uh, Alan Turing first described what became known as the Turing test, but what he called the imitation game. Um, and that's just a sort of thought experiment um, in which you know you test a computer for a human standard of intelligence. Of course, famously, we have still not built um, a machine that reaches that standard. Um, so Turing, in this article, of course, introduces that concept, that standard. Um, and it was kind of groundbreaking because before this, um, the idea of a computer intelligence, machine intelligence, was a bit vague, right? No one knew how exactly to determine whether a machine, whether a computer was in fact intelligent. So he sort of wandered into this debate and came up with a fairly brilliant way of determining this kind of controversial question. But I, I think what makes this article really significant is actually the second idea that you find um, in its pages. And I'll turn to um, a subsection of the article, um, which Turing gives the title learning machines, right? So you can see there, section seven, learning machines. So again, before this article, it was assumed that you know, machines could only do what they were told to do, right? And that was it. Uh, machines, Turing says, were often thought to never be able to surprise human beings. Um, of course, he responds by saying, actually machines surprise me all the time. Uh, and he has this really enduring view of the potential to actually program a machine, a computer, to behave in a way that was similar to the child's mind, right? So this was hugely groundbreaking. Um, the assumption had long been, been, you know, let's program a computer to resemble an adult mind. But what Turing said was, no, let's, let's consider a heuristic model for um, programming a machine that might attain artificial intelligence so that we could actually teach the machine through sort of um, you know, question and response uh, interactions rather than trying to sort of anticipate every possible scenario and program for every possible scenario. So it's, like, I, I use the word endearing because um, I, I really like Turing's later papers, his later scholarship, for this sort of boundless optimism that they show. You know, after his academic work, uh, first at Cambridge and then at Princeton, and then his wartime service, of course, at Bletchley Park um, in the cryptanalytic unit, uh, which we'll actually be seeing at uh, uh, Enigma Machine in just a moment. So after that sort of official um, work and academic work, he, he joins the University of Manchester. Um, and a lot of his work in this period, in the early 50s, um, right before he dies, um, it's, it's much more speculative and imaginative. And I think this article is a perfect example of that imaginative range that Turing was capable of. And literary style, he writes in a really engaging way. One thing that I really like about this article is the way that it ends. So I'm gonna to turn to that line. And he writes, um, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done, right? So again, this sort of sense of boundless optimism um, and you know, applying our imagination to these fairly technical problems. You know, if we do that, if we accomplish that sort of imaginative element in this work, um, really we can sort of find out amazing things. Um, so you know, there's also a tragic element to this story um, because you know, of course, four years after the publication of this article, Alan Turing would die by suicide. Uh, after being convicted by the British government for a gross indecency, basically being prosecuted for his homosexuality. Um, and he was forced to undergo a regime of um, chemical castration, essentially. So just terrible end to a brilliant life and the loss uh, is somewhat incalculable. You know, what, what would he have contributed had he been given another 50 years of life? Um, we just can't know.
Another reason why I'm sharing this book is I often get the question, you know, what makes a rare book rare? And I think this is an example of a book that might not look the part, um, but is rare uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, we tend to assume, you know, a rare book is not only valuable uh, and significant in history, um, but it looks good. Um, and as, as you can see with this one, it's not a very good looking copy of this book. Um, you know, there are library stamps on the edge. This is in sort of a basic library, what's called a buckram binding. Um, and there are actually pieces of tape holding pages of Turing's article together. Um, so, you know, and there, there are copies out there uh, in the antiquarian book market that come up at auction that are in pristine condition that have the original binding. But, you know, I kind of like that this copy is a bit beat up because this is CMU's copy, right? As recently as two months ago, this copy was in circulation. Uh, CMU students could come in and check it out. Um, so, and that's sort of an, an ongoing project in special collections um, in the libraries here. It's something that we've been able to do during quarantine, but we're sort of methodically going through the catalog and looking for important articles in the history of computer science, uh, much, much like this one, um, Turing's here. You know, articles by people like John von Neumann, Claude Shannon, Grace Hopper, right? These sort of pioneers that are contemporaries of Turing. Uh, and we're identifying those as culturally significant, um, particularly in this story that we're trying to tell about the history of computing, and we're moving them to special collections, right? So that we have, you know, an original um, copy, of, you know, the, the material artifact of the, the, the origination of that idea um, contained in them. Um, but, you know, and there's also, the, there's also the aura of provenance in this particular copy, um, which I can wax poetic about. Um, you know, this was the copy of Turing's um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence that was in circulation when Herb Simon uh, was working right here. So, you know, it has, it has the history of place right in it. And um, for that reason, you know, I, I don't particularly care that it's beat up. It's, it's CMU's copy. Um, so that's, that's a, just an example of how, you know, books, despite condition, uh, despite appearance, can become rare, right? Particularly as the ideas they contain kind of transcend to cultural relevance and importance. Uh, and that's certainly true of Turing's book here. So next, as promised, um, these are probably the most well-known objects in the collection, if not the most immediately recognizable, at least when their cases are closed. These are two Enigma machines. Um, they're, they're cipher devices used uh, most famously or infamously by the Nazi military in World War II. Um, and we have a uh, three rotor model, and that'll make sense when I open them up, and a four rotor model. And I wanna start with them closed because you can see the original serial numbers at the back of the boxes here and here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll turn them around carefully. You can see that they're encased in these sort of oak veneer um, boxes um, that have handles on them so that they would have been you know, portable in, in field service. Um, and then on the backs there are these metal latches which open and then very gently there we are. So I'll move that one there. That's the three rotor model. You can see the three rotors and this one is the four rotor. This one, carefully set that down there. So these are of course famous objects. Um, they have a very dark history naturally being used by the Nazis, um, but they're also relevant to the collections we're building, um, not least because Alan Turing, whom we just met, uh, worked on deciphering uh, the Enigma code at Bletchley Park during World War II. So the Enigmas were or the Enigma machine was originally invented by a man named Arthur Scarbius, who was a German inventor in the 1920s. Uh, and the original object of the Enigma machine was actually to disguise commercial secrets, right, business secrets. Um, so that's who they were sold to initially. Um, but the German military, of course, very quickly uh, recognized um, the security that they provided in um, secret communications and co-opted the technology, um, refined it, developed it further, uh, and both of these are examples of the later sort of 1930s, 1940s era enigmas um, that have these sort of plug boards at the front. Gently fold this down, All right? Um, so I mentioned that this is the three rotor model. Um, 
it's the earlier of the two, uh, and primarily used by the German uh, army uh, and also the Air Force. Um, so, you know, again, this is kind of like Leibniz's calculator uh, earlier in that you really can't see uh, the mechanical complexity of the device uh, without removing the case. Um, but it's electromechanical, it was powered by a battery. And you know, very, ba very basically, uh, when you press one of its typewriter-like keys, uh, you initiate an electrical current, which passes through a secret um, you know, electrical route uh, to one of these windows, um, each one showing a letter, and that window would light up, right? And also, every time you pressed one of its keys, um, the leftmost rotor would advance one step, right? And then once you got through all positions of the leftmost rotor, this one would then move forward once, kind of like uh, an odometer on an old car, right? Um, but what that meant is that once you set up, you know, the three rotors in the initial position, right, with every press of a key, the settings would change, right? So that if I were to, exam for example, press E three times, each of those three times, it would be assigned another um, cipher character to hide it, right? So that's what made it almost unbreakable, right? Because basically the settings of the cipher would change with every single character of, of what the plain text entered in to become the cipher text. Um, but that wasn't enough, right, for the German Navy. And so the four rotor model was developed, which basically added, again, another rotor, another level of complexity um, to the cipher system. Uh, and the reason why the Navy, the German Navy, the Nazi Navy, um, developed the four rotor model was to protect um, communications regarding its very important U-boat fleet. Um, and you know, if you, if you look at these, one thing I really like about the two enigmas we have, this one is in impeccable condition. You almost wonder if it ever saw a service in the field, whereas this one is a little bit beat up. It's the, the metal components are more rusty. Um, the sort of uh, finish on the casing is kind of worn away. It has this patina. Uh, and I like to think that that's because it was exposed to sort of the salt air of, you know, its naval commission. You know, I don't know, but, um, but I like to think. But so these are naturally incredibly rare um, objects. Um, you know, the Nazi people, soldiers in the Nazi, Nazi military were required to destroy the Enigma machine if they were ever captured or at risk of imminent capture. Um, so the fact that these survive, um, you know, is kind of an accident of history. Um, I think there are about 350 um, surviving um, examples of the three rotor model and about half that number of the four rotor model, which is far rarer. Um, so these uh, uh, are in the Traub McCordic collection. Uh, again, that's something that Keith uh, referenced in his introduction. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have them. Uh, and already they've um, kind of made possible really interesting educational uh, programs. Uh, in fact, students, graduate students, uh, came uh, into Special Collections about a year ago, year and a half ago, and took these apart, right, to actually look at how they're put together. Um, and that was um, an initiative, a program uh, sponsored by the HOST uh, program, the History of Science and Technology Group at CMU. Um, so that there's, there's huge potential here, right, that you can learn, people studying, you know, um, block ciphers or, you know, advanced encryption methods, it kind of starts here, right, the history of cryptology. Um, and these join a number of books in the history of, of cryptography and cryptology. Um, and so we're sort of, we're, this is sort of a side, a side branch of this, this um, history of computing collection that we're, we're starting to develop. Uh, we have several things in the history of cryptography in addition to things in the history of computing. And of course, those two fields are kind of inextricably linked. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll just end by saying that it's, there's again that aura um, uh, having these shelved nearby works by Alan Turing, um, you kind of have that history, that relationship that he had with, with these very dark machines, um, kind of at the height of his career, encapsulated in the form of a collection on shelves. With this next object, we turn to something a bit more literary. Um, so this is a first edition copy, first printing of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, and this copy in particular is 
I think incredible because it's in immaculate condition. You can see that it's in its original blue paper binding uh, with this sort of gray spine. Uh, the title is you know, penned on the spine, volume number there. It's typically uh, in this period, it was published in 1818, when someone bought a book like this from the bookshop, they would then take it to have it bound in a style uh, and level of opulence sort of of their choosing, um, sort of to fit their budget and style and taste. But this one, for whatever reason, comes down to us uh, in its original binding, and that's very unusual. I, th I think, personally, this is one of the best copies uh, of Frankenstein in existence, so it's really marvelous that we have it. Um, another wonderful thing about this particular copy um, is that laid inside um, is a letter, a manuscript letter from Mary Shelley, um, it has nothing to do with this book. I thought that it might have been a previous owner who just bought this letter and then laid it in as a sort of an addition to the value of this book. Uh, but there's her signature there, Mary Shelley. Um, so Frankenstein, you know, why, why did I choose to share this book in particular? Well, you know, it's often viewed as... Um, a sort of story of horror, you know, sort of the, the original monster story. Of course, it's been subject to a, a host of cinematic adaptations. Um, but b besides that, I would actually make the case that it's the first sort of recognizable work uh, of science fiction. Um, and that's because of something really quite simple that um, Mary Shelley actually refers to in her preface. Um, she said, I'll just read the first line, she says, um, the event on which this fiction is founded has been supposed um, as not of imp impossible occurrence, right? So she's saying, you know, the, the, the sort of revivification, the resuscitation of a human body with an electrical current um, is not impossible, right? It's, there's a level of possibility there. Um, and we know that when this was first published, again in 1818, um, the response from early readers was, did this happen, right? There was some uh, at least belief that what the, the events that described were possible. Um, the reason for that uh, is something that was going on at the time, about the same time, um, and that's demonstrated by these two other books that I have here. Um, the first is from 1792. I'll turn to the title page here. Um, this is Luigi Galvani's work on animal electricity. Um, in the motion of muscular, musculature, right? So Galvani and his nephew um, Giovanni Aldini uh, discovered that when muscles were exposed to an electrical current, they would contract, right? And they, they conducted fairly morbid experiments on animals, and then eventually Aldini um, experimented on, on a human corpse, which we'll get to in a moment, um, showing that you know, if you expose um, tissue to an electrical current, something happens. Right? It almost seems to leave its state of rictus and come back to life. Um, so this copy, it's, you can see it's on blue paper, uh, which is unusual. That, that was sort of deluxe sort of presentation copies of works were printed on blue paper. This copy is from the Posner Memorial Collection. Um, it was given by the, the family of Henry Posner Sr. Um, to the university. We now hold it uh, for them. Uh, it's particularly strong in the history of science. Um, as a brief aside, you know, I don't have time to show everything here, but there's also a first edition copy of Isaac Newton's Principia um, in that collection, as well as first editions by Darwin, Galileo, Kepler, etc. So it's really, really strong in the history of science and technology. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have it here. So I'll turn to illustrations um, in these two books. At the back here in Galvani, you have depictions of frog legs um, being exposed to an electrical current there. Uh, so the frog's legs would sort of jump uh, when electrified. Uh, but more to the purpose, getting back to Mary, Shelley, and Frankenstein, is um, a later book. So I said that was published in 1792. Um, this is 1804. Um, this is um, Giovanni Aldini, so the nephew of Galvani, continued these experiments and eventually published uh, his um, theoretical and experimental essay on galvanism, right? Because at that time, the name of his uncle um, sort of was lent to this new phenomenon. Um, and the reason why this is, I think, more important in relationship to Shelley and Frankenstein uh, is that in 1803, a year before this was published, um, Aldini conducted these electrical experiments on um, 
the recently deceased body of the murderer George Forster in London. Uh, and there are illustrations um, showing these experiments undertaken in London just there, right? Um, and you know, I don't think that there's a direct line from Aldini and Forster and Shelley. I mean, at the time, Shelley was only five years old, but this was sort of an event in London society. Uh, it was written about uh, repeatedly, and of course, these depictions, these illustrations circulated fairly widely. So, um, and I, you can see, right, it's kind of, kind of morbid, but um, uh, sort of witness accounts say that, you know, when uh, George Forster's body was exposed to an electrical current, you know, even one of his eyes opened. So there's this sort of visual immediacy of, you know, a body being uh, resurrected um, that I think Shelley had in mind when she wrote her account of Frankenstein's monster. Um, but, you know, I, I go back to my original point, which is, you know, this is less a horror story than it is a work of science fiction. And that's because Mary Shelley, um, way ahead of her time in sort of writing about current science and imagining uh, its potential applications, right, or its, or its potential outcomes. Um, and of course, there's, there's also a tenuous connection to the history of computing because the first performance um, of Frankenstein, when, when um, Shelley read to her group of friends, um, Byron, Lord Byron was present, and of course Byron's daughter, Ada Lovelace, was an incredibly important pioneer in the history of computing, worked with Charles Babbage on developing the difference engine. Um, so it's, you know, there's, there's that genealogy again um, that even reaches to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. Um, but you know, so you sort of see these conversations happening uh, between these artifacts and books, and I think in a, in a really fascinating way. So this next um, item is a true treasure in special collections. Um, many of you will recognize it. I'll open to the front page. This is a copy of Shakespeare's first folio um, published in 1623 in London. Um, so it's significant because it's the first um, collected edition of all of Shakespeare's plays to show to, to appear in one book. Um, it was published seven years after Shakespeare died in 1616. Um, it's and it's always been a, a sort of collector's item. You know, it's it's famously. Uh, valuable and valued by, by collectors, though not particularly rare. There are something like 235 copies in existence. Um, the other reason why this book is significant, it's not just its rarity, it's not just its value, um, but it, it's the question of survival. Um, so there are 36 of Shakespeare's plays in this book, and a full half, 18, appear nowhere else, right? And um, so absent Shakespeare's original manuscripts, none of which survive, um, these are, these are the, this is the only attestation of those 18 plays. So you know, if this book hadn't been printed, if this book didn't exist, um, plays like Macbeth and Julius Caesar uh, would not exist either. So um, it's, it's a demonstration of the kind of remarkable survival that the printing press um, could sort of affect in this period uh, when so many texts were lost. Um, so that would be significant in and of itself, the fact that we have a first folio, um, it's very unusual to have one of these, um, and we're very lucky to have it. That's not all, though. Uh, we actually have two copies each of the second folio, um, the third, the second folio, the third folio, and the fourth folio, which are all the folio editions of Shakespeare's plays that were published in the 17th century. Um, and this matters that these are all in one place because you can sort of study how Shakespeare was received through the 17th century, how you know, um, readers and performers of his plays um, sort of changed their, their um, understanding of his language um, over you know, most of a century. So this last thing that I'll share is actually a new acquisition. It's something that we purchased for the collection um, just last month uh, and it arrived just last week. Um, so this is actually the first um, printed book on the subject of robotics. Uh, it was published uh, in Venice in 1589, so it's quite an old thing. And I, I love the title. So this is a, a, it's an Italian translation of a classical work by Hero of Alexandria on uh, mechanics and automata, which are sort of early robots. Um, but the Italian translation, I think, is, of the title is really wonderful. It's um, on automatons or machines that move themselves, right? Which is, I think, a brilliant um, definition, uh, if you will, of ro robots. Um, so, 
you know, there was there was a 17th century and late 16th century fascination with robots and automata. They're sort of you know advanced puppets in a way. But uh, again, you know, as I was talking uh, earlier about the sort of genealogy of the history of computing, you know, there's a there's a comparable genealogy in the history of robotics. Um, and this gives me an opportunity to call out my um, really brilliant colleagues in the university archives, uh, who are currently working on putting together uh, a robot archive, right? A sort of archive of CMU's work and innovation in innovations in robotics and the story of robotics sort of from a more contemporary lens. Um, so, you know, I, I view it as special collections role to tell the prehistory uh, of that story. Um, and I think I would argue that that prehistory really starts here with this book uh, and the sort of uh, reception of classical mechanics and the sort of effort by Renaissance scientists to build machines um, that do things um, like robots might do today. Um, so I'll give you one example uh, with an illustration here, uh, which I just, I really like. Um, it's, an, it's an image of a machine that cuts wood automatically, right? So you have this sort of awkward um, apparatus, uh, the gear, with these sort of sharp teeth and these two weights, uh, which actually power the machine. Um, the idea being, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this actually worked, but you know, the idea being, can we construct an automata that would be capable of doing something that might be viewed as difficult by, by humans, right, cutting wood. So thank you for joining me uh, for this special behind the scenes look into some of the treasures in special collections. Um, you know, I hope that we've given you a sense of the kinds of things that we're collecting, our ambitions for the collection, and the kinds of research and projects that we support in Special Collections. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to me with any questions, um, and I look forward to the Q&A following. Thank you very much. Sam, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us that first glimpse into the world of special collections at CMU. Some remarkable treasures there, which I'm sure we will talk more about as we work through the questions that the audience are sending in. And please um, do send your questions in. I can tell already we have more than 20. We're not going to get through them in the next 20 minutes, but we will follow up um, with each of you individually or publish our responses with the video. We'll, we'll figure something out. But Sam, I'm really intrigued to begin our conversation by asking you to say a bit about how you got to where you are today. And, you know, what, what sort of training prepares you for this role? And, you know, you, you've got a, a very eclectic knowledge. I'd love just to, to tease that out a little bit farther. Yeah, it's, it's a question that I get um, pretty frequently. And it's, it's a question that I can really only answer like, having in retrospect, like looking back on, on you know, where I've been uh, and the people I've met along the way. Um, but I think my journey into rare books really started in undergrad. Um, I worked in the rare book collection at the university I was at, um, first in the cataloging department, um, but then eventually the curator, she sort of took me under her wing and uh, invited me to participate on some really fascinating projects. Um, and then I eventually convinced the university's um, conservator to let me work in the conservation lab, you know, basically building um, enclosures for books, archival enclosures for books, and repairing tears in uh, manuscripts. Um, so, you know, and, and looking, I don't think I was aware then how like lucky I was. Um, you know, I was an English major, um, but I, I think that the, the fairly comprehensive view of um, that I got into how a special collections library like operates day to day. I think it planted a seed um, that from that point sort of started to grow. Um, and, you know, after that experience, that really sort of led me to pursue um, a graduate degree in librarianship first. So I actually did that in, in New York City. Um, and I did that in New York City because there was a program that, that offered a concentration in rare books and special collections librarianship. Um, and that was really formative, uh, not just because it was well taught, you know, at the time it was led by uh, Fernando Pena, who's just an exceptional teacher. He's now at the, the book department at Christie's Auction House. Um, but also because, you know, the, the program was in New York City, which, you know, uh, you, 
you have in a very small geographic area, some of the most important and phenomenal special collections libraries in the world, you know, places like the New York Public Library, um, the Morgan Library, Columbia University, the Grolier Club. Um, and so, and in a lot of my coursework in, in librarianship sort of took me into these collections to, to work and research. Um, but, you know, just sort of pursuing that, that through line, um, I think the most formative experience that I had uh, was actually working in the antiquarian book trade. Uh, you know, through a friend of a friend, I was sort of put in touch with um, the antiquarian book selling firm, W.P. Watson, who specializes in the history of science. And um, so I ended up working for Rick, who's the owner um, at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, you know, basically selling books and learning the trade. Uh, and I think that that might surprise some people. Uh, I think there tends to be uh, a pretty stark divide between librarianship and the antiquarian book trade. And I, I think for a large part, that's, that's for a good reason. Um, but you know, my time in the trade showed me that, you know, booksellers are themselves really phenomenal scholars. And there was this entire sort of intellectual world in the history of books. Uh, and there was always going to be more to learn. All right. So I think that experience really led me um, to pursue a PhD. After that, so I went to the University of Virginia, which its English department is sort of known for having this concentration in the history of books and bibliography, which is sort of the, the science of the physical book, the artifact, uh, the book as artifact. Um, you know, famously, you know, the University of Virginia hosts um, Rare Book School, which has been called um, summer camp for book nerds, right? So there's sort of this, uh, there's this culture there that really spoke to me that centered on the book as an artifact. Uh, and so I viewed my time there uh, as a kind of a necessary period for kind of honing my research chops right in this field. Um, so yeah, I, I finished the PhD late last year and was very fortunate to be considered for this job and to get it. So that's sort of, that's sort of my backstory. Well, wonderful. Well, we're, we're of course thrilled that you chose to come to see me. We're delighted to have you on our faculty. A, a couple of questions about conditions and, and that sort of thing. Um, let me preface the first question by acknowledging that I see on the attendee list this afternoon, Mary Kay Johnson, your predecessor, and she deserves a lot of credit for the first part of the question, which is the books are in remarkable condition. How do you maintain them in such good shape? And secondly, the predictable question that we knew would come, which is absolutely in line with what I was taught, which is surely you should be wearing white gloves whenever you handle rare books or artifacts. And did you leave yours at home or was it deliberate not to wear them? Yeah, it is, it is a very common question, um, but I'm always happy to get it because I think it shows that there's a sense of reverence around these materials. So people want to see them being handled with, with gloves, you know, cotton gloves. Um, but it's, it's actually better to not use gloves for books at least um, because when you have a glove on your hand, you sort of lose that tactile, um, you know, accuracy and you're more likely to tear a page or something. Um, I will say that, you know, if I had handled the Enigma machines or Leibniz's calculator more closely, like actually, you, know, I, I mean, you could probably tell that I was careful not to touch a lot of the metal components. I probably would have worn uh, metal gloves because, you know, the acids, the oils and skin uh, would damage those materials. But in the case of books, you know, are mainly made out of leather, wood, paper, you know, uh, and the paper is incredibly high quality, you know, linen rag. It survived for centuries and they were, they were designed to be handled, you know, without gloves. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a common question, a good question. Um, and the other, the first part, and I'm glad Mary Kay is here. Hi, Mary Kay, um, is really about sort of the environmental conditions that we keep these books in. So we're lucky at CMU uh, to have a dedicated space that's environmentally controlled, that has, you know, the security, is, it, um, you know, that you'd expect for this kind of collection. But, you know, we keep everything at uh, a fairly regular temperature and also relative humidity level, sort of an ideal range, right, to ensure that these things last for, for centuries more, right? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Questions are also coming in about access to these items. And, and there are, are two threads to this. The first is, do you have these things digitized? Can we view them on screen? And if you don't, do you plan to? And the second is 
some variant on the theme of can I come and look at these things? What are the opportunities for current faculty and students, alumni, members of the public to visit and look at the items you've shown us today and other things in the special collections? Yeah, um, so we are lucky at CMU to have a digitization lab. So we do have a program of scanning some of the things we have in the collection and then providing access to those scans on our digital collections repository. We're actually working on sort of a new um, interface for that resource right now. Um, and then, you know, access is as open as possible, really. I mean, if, if you have an interest in seeing something as a CMU student, as a CMU affiliate, whether an alumni or otherwise, you know, reach out to me and we can, we can set something up. You're right. Right now it's a little strange, obviously with, with access being a bit cur curtailed. Um, but it's, it's part of my job really to provide access to these things to make sure that, that they're there to be seen and enjoyed and researched. Um, so yeah, that's, that's always, always an option. How do you build things for the collection in, in terms of how do you decide what to to select and purchase or bring into the collection? And how do you make decisions about gifts and donations? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the question is kind of, you know, how do we acquire things? Um, you know, it's either one of two ways really, um, either by donation, someone gives us something, right? Usually alumni uh, who have assembled a collection over the course of their lives and want to see that collection you know, kept intact and um, put to use in some way. Uh, you know, giving to a place like CMU ensures that that that's possible, that that's the case. Um, so that's that's pretty conventional. Um, but the other way is that we acquire things um, by purchase. And that's either through the antiquarian book trade or at auction. Um, and what guides those decisions? You know, what what we accept as donation, what we what we end up buying, we end up writing a pretty comprehensive collection development strategy, right? Which kind of articulates our focus for the collection. Um, and as I mentioned in the, the pre-recorded section of this event, you know, we're really starting to focus increasingly on the history of computing, um, cryptography, robotics, right? Things, things that CMU is known for, right? And that that's the goal, right? You want you want the collection, you want special collections to reflect um, the culture of the institution it's part of, right? Um, you want it to be relevant and interesting to the community that, that it serves. Um, but, you know, to circle back to the question of like donation, you know, it's certainly true at CMU and I think it's true at most special collections libraries, but we really only exist because of, you know, the well-timed generosity of donors over the years. Um, you know, the story of the founding of the Rare Book Collection really goes back to the Hunt family. Uh, Rachel Hunt uh, was, I, I would argue, probably the most important collector of botanical books um, in her generation, maybe of all time. Um, and she had this really phenomenal collection in the history of botany, um, and she wanted to find a home for it. So the, on the condition that CMU would accept this collection, uh, and this would eventually become the Hunt Institute for Botanical Documentation. On that condition, um, the Hunts agreed to fund the construction of Hunt Library. Um, and, you know, Rachel Hunt being a typical book collector, she had, you know, a variety of tastes. So she didn't only collect botanical books. She was actually a bookbinder herself. Um, and she just collected fairly widely in other fields. So, um, her non-botanical books, right? Everything else in her collection came to CMU libraries and began sort of formed the core of special collections. Um, so that was that was the foundation. And then um, another really important donation in the late 70s came from Charles Rosenblum, who is a sort of Pittsburgh entrepreneur. Uh, for example, he he gave um, all the folios that we had, or the Shakespeare's first folio, and then copies of the second, third, and fourth. Uh, there are also copies of the second, third, and fourth in the Posner uh, Memorial Collection. Um, so, you know, but that that really kind of added a lot of really amazing things. Rosenblum's gift, uh, including Frankenstein, uh, the copy we just saw. And then a little bit later, um, the Posner Memorial Collection was founded by the Posner Farnats Foundation, the Posner family. And Henry Posner Sr. 
kind of like Rachel Hunt, was, was really a leading collector in the history of science and technology in particular uh, for most of the 20, second half of the 20th century. Um, so, you know, his, his collection, which is sort of was founded in his memory, is really strong in those fields. Um, yeah, donation, purchase, uh, we're really, those, those are the two ways that we get things, yeah. So we have a couple of questions, and I will see now we're at 45 questions. We're certainly not going to get through these, but questions about, the, the and you've touched on this already, but the themes that you are interested in pursuing as you further develop the collection, you, you've touched on things like robotics and the history of science, but do you have a, a crisp list of themes or is it a very open and speculative um, process? And also a question about what is the landscape in the current collections around the history of science? You know, are there other treasures? You know, if, if we were doing a second yeah. episode of this, what would be the next set of treasures? Yeah, um, it's it's a frustration, right? We're sort of limited for time, but there are so many treasures I wish I could have shared. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. But you know, the question of you know the focus of the collection. Um, you know, I, I said earlier that my goal is certainly to make the collection relevant to you know the teaching and research focus of CMU. Um, you know, the challenge is to make that that collection speak to the community it's meant to serve. That's that's what I said earlier, um, and you know, it's it's kind of a personal challenge for me personally, personally because you know I'm kind of a dyed in the wool humanist. Um, so I've had to rethink a lot of the assumptions that I bring to special collections librarianship. Um, and kind of rethink what that category, right, special collections might mean or could mean at a place like CMU. Um, but, you know, having, having said that I'm a dyed-in-the-wool humanist, uh, I would also describe myself as a technologist, right? I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't have that expertise, but some of my favorite books um, are in the history of, uh, of science, history of technology. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think these books in these fields are the most beautiful and the most fascinating. Um, so there again, I, I think I found the prospect of working at CMU and taking on, you know, the role of leading this collection as something really exciting. Um, but, you know, that, that there's, there's a host of challenges in that. And I think particularly, you know, as the cost to collect things, um, you know, not only the cost to purchase things, to acquire things, but to safely house them, uh, as that cost like, continues to increase, you know, every university can't collect everything, right? So we kind of have this imperative um, at a place like CMU uh, to sort of rigorously select um, our focus, pare it down to the essentials so that we can become a leader in, in a particular field or fields. Um, and, at CMU, I think that's going to mean building, uh, frankly, a fairly weird collection, but also a wonderful collection, and that it's not just books, right? Um, and that's why we have things like the Enigma or Leibniz's calculating machine, uh, which I think is very unusual, right? These are things that you might find in a museum dedicated to the history of science, but very rarely in a special collections library. Um, and that, that presents, you know, kind of day-to-day -day challenges, right? The infrastructure of a library is kind of designed to handle book shaped things. Um, so to toss in, you know, an electromechanical cipher device um, kind of into the works, uh, it's forced us to kind of think quickly and think differently about what we're doing. Um, yeah, I think, I think in, an, in an academic community that's, that's made up of, you know, certainly really brilliant humanists and students in the humanities, but also engineers and computer scientists, um, you know, these kinds of objects, enigmas, calculating machines, et cetera, they're just as legible and interesting as a 400 year old book. Um, so, you know, my task uh, is to find out how to care for, describe and um, provide access to some of these things. Um, you know, both Shakespeare's first folio and things like early transistors, right? Um, which is, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish by just speaking briefly about other things that we have in the collection. Um, you know, the hist we're really lucky, I, I said this in the, in the pre-recorded section, but we're very fortunate to have the Posner Memorial Collection because, you know, it's full, chock full of these high points in the history of science that are almost unobtainable now, certainly in the antiquarian book market at auction. 
you know, um, usually private collectors are buying these things, um, but libraries are sort of on the sidelines for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, I mentioned we have a first edition of the Principia Mathematica, you know, Isaac Newton, foundational in the history of modern physics um, and mechanics. Um, we also have a first edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. It's actually inscribed to his friend. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the friend, which I should know, but, you know, so it's, it's a really fascinating artifact about, you know, Dar Darwin's like intellectual circle. Um, we have a first edition of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus, uh, which is a mouthful, uh, but it's, that's the first description of the heliocentric um, you know, solar system, right? So before then it was always assumed that the earth is at the center of the solar system or um, uh, terrestrial system, I guess. Um, but 1542, right? Uh, Copernicus publishes this and sort of throws that out the window. Um, yeah, so there, there, there are so many treasures um, and I, I, do, I do regret that we don't have more time to share them. But again, access is open. If you have questions about things we have, if you wanna see some of these things, uh, do feel free to reach out. And I've no doubt we will have a, a second edition of this in a smaller world, a bit of unstaged propping. The ink illustration over my left shoulder is of the cathedral in Poland where Copernicus was baptized, but that's a story for another day. Uh, somebody asked the, the interesting question, you know, have you read, I think the question was, have you read all of the books, but you've only been here a few months, but do you read the books that are in special collections? And a supplementary from another questioner, do you enjoy normal books and what sort of thing do you read in your free time? I know you've got a, what, a four month old child, so um, time might be tight, but love to hear your, your reading habits. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's essential that, you know, a cur someone in my role, a curator of special collections is actually reading the things that are in his or her care. Um, and that's something that I've really enjoyed doing is actually reading things by Alan Turing, for example. I had never read Alan Turing. My background is in English literature, 17th century English literature and bibliography, book history. Um, and I, I commented on that in the pre-recorded section that like it really amazed me to find that you know, Alan Turing's articles are not only approachable, but like really engaging. He writes, he has his own literary style. Um, and I think it's, you know, there, there's this false distinction that's often made with like the humanists are creative and the scientists are more you know, like empirical. Um, but I think what, you know, special collections in the history of science and technology can show is that, no, there's this amazing imaginative world um, that's going on in the history of science that, you know, all you have to do is sort of crack some of these books open and, and you find it pretty quickly. Um, and the question is, do I, do I read? Uh, yes. I mean, you can see behind me, this is only probably a, an eighth of, of my book collection, um, you know, but so it's it obviously comes with the territory of doing a PhD in English literature. Um, you know, as, as I said, my background is, is mainly in 17th century poetry, um, you know, antiquarian literature, but yeah, I, I, co I collect books myself. Um, I, I've always been a book person and uh, always shall be a book person. So, yeah. Well, there was a lovely book, um, it's probably more than 20 years old that was published in the UK um, called The Cambridge Quintet, which featured a, a fictitious dinner party hosted by C.P. Snow. And you prompted me to, to think of that because C.P. Snow wrote about the two cultures. Um, he was a, a, a great British um, polymath of the, the mid 20th century. And I had wondered whether Snow and Turing might have been in some way contemporaries. And of course that, that book featured as his four dinner party guests, Alan Turing as one of the guests, uh, alongside Wittgenstein, Schrödinger, and J.B.S. Haldane. Um, so, you know, there, there are lots of potentials there to try and stitch that together. Yeah. But I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of time. We will follow up with um, a release of the recording and um, I suspect a transcript and that sort of thing. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts, Sam, as a final question on those who want to support your work. Um, you know, how can they support special collections? Can they help with acquisitions or your work in any other way? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one that I'm very happy to get. Uh, there's, there's really a host of ways that you can support what we're doing in special collections. Um, 
you know, uh, we're very fortunate in the libraries to have some brilliant people actually working on, you know, making giving easier and more accessible. Um, you know, one example recently, uh, the Posner Foreign Foundation just established a research fellowship um, that will bring one graduate student or an early career scholar into the collection to actually work on a dissertation project or, or article or re research in general. Um, and the Positive Art Arts Foundation has also long uh, supported a um, internship program uh, for graduate students. Um, but more, more recently, we just established an acquisitions fund um, that accepts donations on any scale. Um, and you have to remember that, you know, while we use the acquisitions fund to like buy things, um, purchasing things, acquiring things for the collection, you know, directly supports um, things like research for CME students exhibitions that we put on the libraries and um, other programs, right? So it's acquisitions, but it, it makes what I do and what we do possible um, on, on every level. Um, so if you have ideas on, on, on that vein, you know, get in touch. Um, Morgan Walbert is our, is our associate director for advancement in the libraries and she's been really helpful on um, working on this. So. Well, thank you, Sam. Once again, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to get to know you better, to begin to see the fruits of your work. Thank you again to those who have supported special collections at CMU for many years. Thank you in anticipation to those who might join us on that journey. We'll be in touch with some follow-up materials, a link to the recording, um, answers to some of the questions we couldn't get to. But please do get in touch with Sam, with myself, with Morgan, if there's anything we can help you with. It's been great to see such a large audience. Um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.